Welcome to Centre Church. We hope you enjoy this message recorded live from our Burgess Hill campus. If I'm going to be brutally honest, I have been avoiding coming up and standing on this stage today. I've not been avoiding it for a short time. I've been avoiding it for at least two years because I have this sermon, the first version, back in 2020. And you know, it's interesting. When we look at the Bible, and I did a lot of this when I was a child, you know, you read those stories. And I remember reading Samuel and thinking, how could he mistake God's voice two times? How? I mean, how can you do that? How can you ignore it? How could he possibly get that confused? But as an adult, I have done that way more than two times. And I want to encourage all of you here today who may have been doing that. In whatever aspect of your life it may be, that you may have been ignoring God's voice on your life. Or, like in my case, I have been worse than that, knowing it's God's voice, and letting my own voice inside me say, Samantha, you're not good enough. Literally, like almost every week, you're not good enough to stand up there on that stage. So God spoke to me through many sermons, and I just want to read out a couple of them today just to show exactly those times that I was told by faithful members of this congregation who've stood up here and preached, and I've been blessed by them, but I've still done nothing about it. So, Alex, thank you for this morning. And, you know, you spoke uh, in September last year um, about following your gifting. Robin talked on November last year about the fact that we have a legacy, and he talked again in March and May this year about living a life of significance, and he talked of the first things first. Tyler spoke in January that we were made for such a time as this. My mother taught in Sunday school in January about the body of Christ and our unique skills in the church, and wish, thank you for that sermon, in February, that really is what got me up here and what signed me up, talking about courageous living and the fact that the Bible has examples of leaders who actually really struggled and didn't want to do it, didn't want to get up there. Moses said, no, I'm not doing it. In front of a burning bush, I am not doing this, I cannot speak. God said, don't worry, I'll send your brother instead. Um, I'd love to have my sister up here doing the sermon right now, to be honest with you. Um, uh, And then Graham Mason uh, in February, Fruits of the Spirit, first of which is love. So that was at least seven times, and I know there is a lot more. Um, And so before I board the boat to Nineveh, a storm comes, and I get thrown overboard, and I really don't want to be eaten by a fish, I thought, best come up here and do this sermon. So this is God's sermon, not just to you, but to me as well. He gave me the words. And as I said, those examples, this is not the first time we've heard this message. But I want to give you just a little bit of a different vision, maybe, on it. I want to remind you of one simple fact, just one. And if you can take one thing away from today, and that is that God loves you. Absolutely every single one of you. This is not a small thing. This is a big thing. I want to see you to see yourself through his eyes. His love is empowering. His gifts are immense. His peace and happiness he has for you. It's just phenomenal. And in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 4, it says, love is patient and kind. I had those Bible verses read over me and Guy when we got married. And the patience from God over these past two years, and my husband as well, but that's, that's a given. But the patience from God over these past two years, as I've been avoiding this, has been immense. We have a song in Sunday school that goes, How broad, how long, how high, how deep is the love of God. Now, I sing this, just, I just do it every, you know, whenever my mother says, we're going to do this in Sunday school. And actually, it's really interesting, because that breadth of God's love 
in our life. It's phenomenal. And that's from actually from Ephesians 3, verse 17 to 18. And we just need to understand the scale of that love for us. Our church vision starts with one church, passionately loving God and people. And it's the foundation of our church that we send out that love, show that love out to the world. But we also need to understand that love for ourselves as well. So I want to talk to you about perspective. What is your perspective of yourself, of your life? And it's interesting because our perspectives of ourselves can actually cause us harm, like not stepping forward in faith. And sometimes we can be hampered by things like depression and other mental illnesses. And I speak from experience there. And one of the reasons that I was felt held back from coming up here because I've been diagnosed with depression and lots of other mental illnesses. And I always thought that was an excuse, a reason why I couldn't do things. But it's not true. Thank you, Wish, for highlighting that. And so when we think about our perspective of ourselves, we may be thinking, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm quite good. I mean, I, I work. I mean, I'm, I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm quite good, versus God's perspective of us, which is, wow, you are amazing. I mean, look at all these things I've given to you. You're a child of God. You're a royal priesthood. I mean, all those things in the Bible, I mean, would we say that about ourselves? You know, hi, I'm a child of God. You know, it's actually, you know, you can be just like, oh my gosh, am I going to go say that to somebody? But that's his perspective as us. And there's an interesting story about an Australian tribe. And in this tribe, rather than seeing things like based upon the weather, because, you know, us British, you can, you can strike up a conversation with a British person any time. How's the weather? Oh, it's too hot. Oh, it's been re oh, the plants need a bit of a water. It's good that it's raining. You know, we have those conversations all the time. But in Australia, in this tribe, their perspective is based upon direction. So their conversations will start, Carol, where are you going today? And they'll say, oh, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going south to visit my friend, or I'm going northeast to have a walk. Everything's based upon their direction. And so they send some um, scholars out there. They have sent some people out there to, to understand this, how this changed their worldview. And they said to them, well, how, how do you perceive time? Now, if you were going to ask me how I perceive time, I'd go, well, time goes from left to right, I suppose. Left, right. Okay, that's how I write. That's how I think. But their time based on the sun, which is the direction. Time flows east to west. Whichever direction they're in, it flows backwards to forwards in this case. This direction. So their perspective is on, not on themselves and how they are oriented, but on the directions of the compass, on the direction of the sun. They know that they can't just rely on themselves. They don't see themselves as the center of the universe, they know that they're part of something bigger. And how does God see us? He loves us. And no matter what we do, he will love us. And those promises remain. And in Colossians 3, verse 2 to 3, it says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden in Christ. It's a huge thing that what we have is in Christ. And going on, I'm going to read Ephesians 2, verse 10. And I love this one. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us. To do. He prepared us. We're, we're his, and it talks about in the Bible that we are his masterpiece. Masterpiece. I mean, that's 
a big thing. A masterpiece takes extreme artistry and skill and dedication. And that is what God had put into us. And it's interesting. I've been talking about perspective. I want to talk about how we need to rely on God. And how do we do that? And it's through being humble. You think, wait a second, how does, that, how does that add up? How does being humble help us be reliant on God? Let me read 1 Peter 5, verses 6 to 7. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, because God opposes the proud but shows favour to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. And I always thought the word humble just meant, you know, I've got to be quiet and meek and, like my parents taught me, be a good girl in church. You know, you, you. but actually, it's interesting because I looked at this. And I thought, I could go back to the Greek um, there's so many preachers here who are so good with going back to all these different past languages that the Bible was in, and I am not one of those people. My mother helped me and my father helped me through languages in school, and God bless them, I just about passed. I am not going to be going back to the Greek, but what I am good at is technology. So I Googled it. Um, <laughs> forgive me, Lord, please. Um, <laughs> so on Googling this, it says humble means to allow God to lower our self-reliance and focus on him so he can care for you. I'm going to repeat that again because I think this is really important for me. To allow God to lower our self-reliance, that's our reliance on ourselves, and focus on him so he can care for us. So that means fixing your eyes on God. Oh, difficult one sometimes. I mean, I, I worry a lot. Um, I ruminate and worry on my anxieties. And it's, it can be really repetitive and really grind you down. But there's a way to do this, a way to rely on God. And Wish and Carol and Graham have mentioned this from the front. But there's a verse in Peter um, that is really clear. That verse that I read out. You've got to stop focusing on your worries and start focusing on him. So one of the ways to do this, and Carol said this um, a couple of months ago from the front, is that we've got to focus on God by repeating scriptures. It's a simple one. In fact, I've got a, a load of scriptures that we read out every single evening. The ones that really kind of like build me up, that really help me. Um, I'm praying the Spirit. I think that's so important. And it's a really simple thing to do. Sit there and go, oh, I'm so worried. How am I going to cope? No. I'm just going to pray, listen to God, repeat scriptures. God is in us. It's a huge power in our lives. It sets us free from things that hold us back. Subconsciousness, fear, doubt, depression. All of those things are lives are lies that, yeah, we, some of us, we do live with them. But that doesn't mean that God hasn't given us those things to be able to speak into our lives and overcome them. God wants you to be free and empowered to follow your purpose. In 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory and are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Amen. And there are consequences if we rely on ourselves, because we shouldn't do. And I have done it so often. And we can sabotage our reliance on him. There's an interesting study that was done on um, the principle that is totally wrong, by the way, um, that women are not good with maths. It's totally wrong. 
Um, thank you, Dad, for teaching me that from a very young age, because anybody who ever said, oh, women are not good at maths, they're wrong. I have a degree in it. There were lots of women on there. Very good. Um, but there was a study done. Got two groups of women, and they were told, yay, you're having a maths test. Even if you love maths, you still don't like maths tests, just, just to be clear. So they got these two groups of women. One, they said, this is a maths test. Off you go. Took the test. The other group, they said, here's a maths test. Just to remind you, women aren't good at maths. How could you do that? So they both took the test. The women who were told that they weren't good at maths significantly underperformed. It's the only difference between the two groups. Because they were listening to something that wasn't true, but they let it affect their performance. We can actually hold ourselves back by things that are said in our lives, in our history, in the past. I've heard a number of people give me stories about, oh, my mother said this, or somebody from my past said this, or, and it can just be one small word. I even had one lady come to me and say, I got told that women with curly hair cannot be leaders. Like, what? <laughs> How could you even believe that? She was like, well, she goes, says, every time I have an interview or an important presentation, I straighten my hair. And I was like, <laughs> wow. I mean, but you know, we can laugh about that, but how many people here have been told things that have been planted as seeds in your life that just are not true? You are good enough. You are amazing. God loves you, and there is a whole Bible full of scriptures that tell you how awesome and amazing you are. And in Romans 2, verse 12, it says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. It's perfect. And guess what? Satan wants to rob you of that. He wants to rob you, you and the church and the world of all of those things that you can do and remind you, yeah, you're not good at maths. You can't do this. All those little voices, ignore them. Tell them to go away. They're not true. Bring them into light. We need to stand on the promise that Jesus has already, and I mean this in the past, he has already paid the price. He's defeated the enemy, and we are safe and secure with him. And in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 15 to 18, I'm not going to read it out now, but it talks about the body of Christ and how we are all different. And this is the next thing I want to talk to you about, is that we are different. <clears throat> and um, I'm going to tell you a little chunk of my story. Um, I didn't want to be different, I had a model in my own family, my mother. Mum, you are awesome. She's going to sit here and cringe for uh, the next few minutes. So, um, She spent 25 years of her life going into schools and preaching to thousands, literally thousands of children. And then to hundreds of Sunday school children, dozens of which she led to God. I was not one of them. Dad, you may never be forgiven for that. She wanted to do it. So. Um, and she and Hannah, who is in youth at the moment, and all the other wonderful Sunday school teachers, youth leaders, helpers, all those things that they input into their lives, I was just like, yeah, you are awesome. This is the future, and that is what I am going to do. So my plan that I thought was God's plan, because my mum did it, so it's got to be a plan and it's got to work. <sighs> um, it was to have a short, good career, you know, acceptable, um, have babies, at least a couple of them, um, because everybody has two kids nowadays, so why not me? Um, and go part-time, follow my mother's legacy. Absolutely great. So I got a degree, got a job, 
and waited for it all to happen. Because it was going to happen. No, it wasn't. It was not God's plan at all. Not his plan for my life whatsoever. And in 2011, my husband Guy got ill. And we struggled for two years. We didn't know what was wrong. It was one of the hardest times of our lives. And in 2013, so nearly 10 years ago now, when we were 29, he lost the ability to walk. Uh, part of his vision, and in months he had a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. And my world bottomed out. Absolutely. That, that, was, not, that was not the plan. I did not know where to go from there. Although my plan had been destroyed, God's plan hadn't because his plan was something totally different. So um, I became the main provider. I was not expecting that. In my mind, typically, man, head of family, wife, that was it. That's what I thought. I thought that was it. But we changed a few roles. We reversed it a bit. And it was fine. But I was following God's plan. There was no other way. And I learned a lot of things that I didn't plan to learn. And now I was following God's plan for my life, not my plan for my life. And in Romans 2, verses 4 to 8, it says, As each one of us has one body and many members, and these members do not have all have the same function. So in Christ, through many forms, one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We all have different gifts according to the grace given to us. So if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. And if it's giving, then give generously. And if it's to lead, do it diligently. They're all different. They're all different. I was like, oh, no. They are. I could do something different. What am I going to do? There's me thinking again. I've got I've to plan something. No. No, absolutely not. I cannot plan this. And, you know, it's interesting because it's taken me years to understand that part in the body that's called me to. God's called me to empower people in their careers. And I thought, God, what are you doing? How does that fit into the body of Christ? That is not on the list of those skills in that Bible verse. I thought, what, what am I going to do? And um, it's interesting, in um, Jeremiah 29, verse 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. And it's really interesting because I've helped hundreds of people now in their careers. Absolutely hundreds. And when people come to talk to me, they're often at their lowest point. What am I going to do? How am I going to handle my finances? I've just been fired, or I need to change a job, and I hate my leader. And I end up mentoring them, coaching them, helping them through that difficult point in their lives even mental health issues. I spent an hour on the floor at work with one of my friends this week, just sitting there saying, it's okay, you can have your panic attack. I'm right here, it's all going to be fine. I helped her, moved her on. But why? Why has God put me in there? What ministry can I do? Interestingly enough, I've done two ministries in the church now that involve those skills. And the Christians Against Poverty Job Club and also Resurgo. Um, which is part of King's Church. And I've mentored countless people and run a workshop on empowerment by myself. And over three years, I've trained 500 people on understanding what it means to be empowered. And some of those I've been able to then speak to about God. You have unique skills. God taught me several skills over years so that I could fit into his plan and from prophecies over me, I know I've barely even started. And I don't know that full picture whatsoever. But does it matter? 
I know I'm walking God's plan for my life because I couldn't stand up here and do this today. I couldn't do all these other things because God has taken me there. And today is a big part of that. I don't know what big part, but I know I've been avoiding it and God's been pushing me enough to know (laughs) that it's really important that I stand up here today. And it's really important that you are not jealous of other people's skills. I have been so jealous of people over the years. Just look at these, go, wow, look at you. Oh, I wish I could do that. And I'm standing up here today, and you may go, yeah, she can do it. She can do all these things. No, I really, really cannot. You would not want me to go out and evangelize. I spent years behind a puppet theater with my mother doing puppets to make sure I didn't have to do that, face painting, any excuse not to have to try and share God's word with people because it really scared me. Also, you would not want me cooking a meal for Alpha. There are some of you in this church that have been blessed with that skill. Praise God for you. Also, praise God for my mother-in-law who taught my husband to cook. I mean, oh, thank you, God. Um, Oh, that would have been difficult. (laughs) And so God is calling you for purpose and he wants to empower you to do that. You're called to be unique and to be different. And in Revelation 7 verse 9, after this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. Languages actually make us all different. There's a whole other sermon there. Your culture, your past, your trials will help you to be relevant to somebody else. I didn't want to go through mental health issues, but the number of people I've been able to talk to on the same level and say, yeah, I struggle with that too, and the difference that it's made to them. We're all different. We're all meant to be different. We've got to have different perspectives. So I'm going to um, talk to you about a hero of mine, um, Gladys Elwood, who was born in 1902. She's my absolute Christian hero. She had no training or money. She knew God had called her to China, but she had no help, not from anyone. She went on a journey. It nearly killed her several times. Pretty much nearly got kidnapped as well. And she took that journey to do things that she was not trained to do, like fixing and running an inn, learning Chinese. Oh, that must be, I mean, I'm not good at languages anyway. Chinese, I mean, the fact they haven't got the same letters as us, that's just, I'm out. Um, I'm no good at that. Um, But she did that. And when her mentor died, she lost her income. God provided the next job for her. A foot inspector. What? You can't have training for that. Who would know how to be a foot inspector? But she did it. She went up into the mountains. She talked to the women, helped them unbind their feet, because in China that was a tradition back then. And she took God's word to every single mountain, region, every village where no other person wanted to go. She took the word of God. And when Japan invaded a few years later, she saved 100 children, 100 orphans, walked them across the mountains by herself, no training, not supported, no money, no backing. She said, I wasn't God's first choice for what I've done in China. I don't know who was. It must have been a man. (laughs) A well-educated man. I don't know what happened. Perhaps he died. Perhaps he wasn't willing. And God looked down and saw Gladys. God said, well, she's willing. So if God has called you to China or any other place and you're sure in your heart... Let nothing deter you. Remember, it's God who called you. And it's the same as when he called you as Moses and Samuel. So what do I want to convey today? Remember what I said at the beginning. I want you to remember God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. Oh my gosh, he loves you. And that power in your life the God who made the heavens and the earth. He chose you. The chances of you being you, incredibly slim. 
but you are here because God chose you. He made you. He spent time forming you. And in Psalm 139, 13 to 18, he says he knitted us together like a garment. And like a garment, you know, it takes a lot of planning, a lot of thinking. How do you want to make it? How do you want to build it? You were planned. You really were. You're not an accident. You're not a mistake. There is a plan here. God spend time thinking about you. But it's through humbling yourself to God, understanding his love to you, that you will be able to fulfill it. I'm just going to finish with Ephesians 1, verses 18 to 19. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his uncomparably great power for those of us who believe. Thank you for watching this week's message. For any more information, or to find out more of what we do as a church, you can contact us at info at centrechurch.uk or check out our website at www.centre-church.uk